I'll be right there. Wake up! Do, 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 do. We need to wake up. Do, 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 do. People, black people, don't you know that we need it so? so. so, so. History. Do, 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 do. We Don't you know that we need it so, 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 so. and Ooh, ever since up, we were brought to this up, land, shoot, there shoot, has shoot, been a master shoot, plan shoot, to keep shoot, us shoot, up, know shoot, shoot, up, ourselves. Oh, so oh, Welcome, welcome, family. Jeff, you've outdone yourself again. I just, I see you just, you know, all up in that, and it's beautiful. So um, look how far we've come uh, with our, our drum calls. It, it gave us so much trouble in the beginning, and now it's, it is uh, flawlessly beautiful. So thank you, Jeff, for that. Uh, what a wonderful start to our first uh, Sunday in February, the beginning of Black History Month, the time that uh, is not so important to this community because we certainly take out time every single day and certainly every Sunday to honor our uh, great heroes and sheroes. But for the rest of the world, you know, they're gonna, they're joining in well, where we are already uh, at and what we uh, have already accepted. Um, but we will still learn more because there's always more to learn Where, wherever we're at. There's still some more for us to learn. There's still something else uh, for us to add to our knowledge bank. So welcome everybody. Um, and now we're gonna have our affirmation. We have my sister, Mama Connie and my brother, Baba Sydney uh, will lead us in the affirmation. Okay, well, good morning community. How is everyone doing? Uh, we're starting off as we always start off uh, our services with uh, a beautiful song and to, to have a powerful libation uh, poured and to have a powerful prayer said. <clears throat> and I think an important part of dealing with, uh, with individually and as a community 
is uh, affirmations, meaning that you speak into power things that you want to be. I say that Same. as well as praying and asking for the most high to, uh, to bless us and help us through. I think part of what we need to do is to say words of strength, say words of power, say words of affirmation, affirming what it is that, that we want to come into existence. I see. I see. And so this morning, we, myself and my wife, want to uh, lead the community in uh, an affirmation. And if you are muted, please stay muted. And then you can read along with us as we say these words and to, 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 to send that spirit out into the atmosphere, to send it out into the universe, saying words of power, saying things that we want to come into being. And with that, we will begin with the affirmation. I, I see, see, I see. <clears throat> we will know God's truth to be free and self-determined. Creator, help us to remember the humanity, glory, and suffering of our ancestors and to honor the struggle of our elders. Let us strive to bring new vision and life to our people. Let there be peace and harmony among us. Ashay. Let us be loving, sharing, and creative. Let us work, study, and listen so we may learn, teach, and cultivate self-reliance. Grant us power, O Holy One, as we struggle to resurrect our hearts and our homeland. Ashay. We will raise our children according to the needs of our nation with discipline, patience, devotion, and courage. We will strive to be the living models of a new direction of our people. I say, oh, we are an African people. We are children of the Most High. I say, I say, oh. Thank you, brother and sister. Um, now that we have affirmed uh, why we are here and reminded ourselves of, of some of our purpose here, we're going to have Minister Amadi, who is going to be joining us for the first time in this role. He's joined us in many other roles, brought us some incredible messages. But today, uh, Minister Amadi is stepping out and he is going to bring us the candle of justice. Minister Amadi, could you join us, please? Thank you. And Hetepu, I've chosen for the reading from the Husea, the book of Keti, uh, the sixth passage, one generation succeeds another, and God who knows human nature is hidden. One cannot avoid or oppose the hand of God. He reaches all that the eyes see. Thus, one should revere God on his path. As a dry water course is replaced by a stream, so no river allows itself to be concealed. It breaks the barrier behind which it was hidden. So too, the soul comes to the place that it knows and strays not from its former path. So I chose that, uh, that reading because I wanted to remind us that we are coming into our time and the glory of our past greatness will be revealed. And it cannot be obliterated by those who have sought to oppress us. Ma'at will prevail. So I've chosen a passage. I'm gonna be talking about the black codes. I'm gonna light my candle for the black code, for, for those who dealt with the convict leasing and the black codes and the vagrancy laws that, that, that were implemented right after the civil right after the um, Civil War. And so I'm reading from The New Jim Crow by, uh, by Michelle Alexander. Large numbers, well, before I, I do that, I'm gonna quote from W.B. Du Bois. The slave went free, stood a brief moment in the sun, then moved back towards slavery, W.B. Du Bois. Large numbers of former slaves roamed the highways in the early years after the war. Some converged on towns and cities. Others joined the federal militia, prompting the provisional Southern legislatures to adopt the notorious black codes. As expressed by one Alabama planter, 
we have the power to pass stringent police laws to govern the Negroes. This is a blessing for they must be controlled in some way or white people cannot live among them. As explained by historian William Cohen, the main purpose of the codes was to control the freed man and, and, to, and the question of how to handle convicted black lawbreakers was very much at the center of the control issue. Nine Southern states adopted vagrancy laws, which essentially made it a criminal offense not to work and were applied selectively to blacks. And eight of those states enacted convict laws, allowing for the hiring out of county prisoners to plantation owners and private companies. Prisoners were forced to work for little or no pay. One Vacancy Act specifically provided that all free Negroes and mulattoes over the age of 18 must have written proof of a job at the beginning of every year. Those found with no lawful employment were deemed vagrants and convicted. Clearly the purpose of the black codes in general and the vagrancy laws in particular was to establish another system of forced labor. Ultimately, the black codes were overturned and a slew of federal rights legislation protecting the newly freed slaves was passed during the relatively brief but extraordinary period of black advancement known as the Reconstruction Era. Southern conservatives vowed to reverse the Reconstruction and sought the abolition, ab abolition of the Freedmen's Bureau and all political instrumentalities designed to secure Negro supremacy. Their campaign to redeem the South was reinforced by a resurgent Ku Klux Klan, which fought a terrorist campaign against the Reconstruction governments and local leaders. The ter terrorist campaign proved highly successful. Once again, vagrancy laws and other laws defining activities such as mischief, the insulting gestures as crimes were enforced vigorously against blacks. The aggressive enforcement of these criminal offenses opened an enormous market for convict le leasing in which prisoners were contracted out as laborers to the highest private bidder. Douglas Blackman in slave, Slavery by Another Name describes how tens of thousands of African-Americans were arbitrarily arrested during this period. Many of them hit with court costs and fines, which had to be worked off in order to secure their release. With no means to pay off their debts, prisoners were sold as forced laborers to lumber camps, brickyards, railroads, farms, plantations, and dozens of corporations throughout the South. Death rates were shockingly high for the private contractors had no interest in the health and well being of their laborers. Unlike the earlier slave owners who needed their slaves at a minimum to be healthy enough to survive hard labor, laborers were subject to almost continually lashing by long horse whips. And those who collapsed due to injury or exhaustion were often left to die. Convicts had no meaningful legal rights at this time and no effective redress. They were understood quite literally to be slaves of the state. And so this continued on until to about 1940s uh, because the, um, finish the reading with this, um, because of the influence of the NAACP and, and its successful legal campaigns challenging Jim Crow laws in the federal courts. But the most important influence was uh, World War II, the blatant contradiction between the country's opposition to the crimes of the Third Reich against European Jews and the continued existence of racial caste system in the United States was proving embarrassing, severely damaging the nation's credibility as the leader of the free world. So basically, from, 19, from 1865 to about the 1940s, there was vagrancy laws, convict leasing, and black, and, and black codes under Jim Crow. And so it, it wasn't until 1964 with their civil rights legislation that black people were actually legally free. And so 
I'm going to light the candle of justice today for our ancestors who had to live with Jim Crow, the Black Codes, and the vagrancy laws. And I'm going to affirm that Ma'at will prevail and our reciprocity is coming. So I'm going to light the candle of justice for those of our ancestors who have suffered for so long. Ashe. Thank you, Minister Ahmadi, uh, for that uh, lighting of the candle of justice for us. This week, we are starting a new tradition. You know, we're constantly growing, we're constantly changing. You know, we are an evolving and, you know, moving people. So the new uh, addition is we are going to have a African safety skills on first Sunday. And that African safety skills is going to be led by our very own wonderful uh, sister Mariana. So I'm going to ask us, uh, Mariana to come up and talk to us about uh, what we will be learning today in this African. That's, did you get that African, African? African safety skills. Uh, come and uh, bless us with your wonderful knowledge, uh, Mariana. Thank you, Sister Darnisha. I appreciate that. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I am here in the spirit of Harriet Tubman. I am here in the spirit of Sekhmet as a protector and a nurturer in our communities, not only in our local communities, but abroad. And so with African safety skills, we wanna make sure that we're getting the gentle yet deep reminders on it's our job to secure ourselves and be safe. It's not FEMA's job, it's not the government's job. We can't sit up and be upset about what they are or are not doing. What we need to do is empower ourselves and put ourselves in divine alignment with that skill set that we have as Africans in, in safety. So for those of you who tuned in last month, we had a wonderful introduction uh, to some of the content that I'll be sharing once a month here in the Wednesday night classes in Wilsa Sacramento. So put your L's up if you were in that workshop. Yes, I see you, I see your L's, I see your L's, lovely. So this one is gonna serve as a deep reminder and a check-in if you've done your homework. For those of you who are new to African safety skills, today we're gonna learn about the essentials and the fundamentals and how it can change our lives by knowing how to pack and keep an updated safety bag. When it comes to safety, there's not enough talk about it, some of y'all didn't do a safety drill since kindergarten when you did stop, drop, and roll uh, for, the, for the fire escape and you were excited because you got to get out of class, right? Well, for us, we're living in a day where we see safety issues happening on a constant basis. We cannot teach and reach uh, and preach about being in a crisis mode as Africans in America without making sure we have safety plans in place. So put your peace sign up if you have an up-to-date safety bag in either your home or in the trunk of your car. I see Baba Emo, I see Minister Mali, Baba Kofi. Yes, I see several of you. All right, for those of you who have it, this is still homework for you because you also want to start gifting those gifts to loved ones instead of giving bath and body works and all them products that everybody else is making that we should be getting from the african market from each other we're going to start gifting safety bags that's right graduations birthday when the baby's born yes the brand new baby needs a safety bag not just a diaper bag for the streets but a safety bag each safety bag that we have for every family member every community member is customized we all have some of the basic needs that we have, but you might have medication. You might have glasses. You might have special instructions if maybe your child is an autistic child or has any kind of special needs. All these bags should be customized for an elder. If you have a teen girl, she needs to have uh, sanitary napkins. Remember that each of us have special needs. So when we go into the basics and the fundamentals, we all have some of the basic things that are necessary for survival and a variety of safety issues, but we should all make sure to have any special medications, instructions or need stored away in our bags as well. So I have an example of one of four bags that I keep it's a nice little hiker's backpack. It's super awesome because it has a, um, a water pouch inside of it where a, stream, a straw comes out and it hits my mouth and I can run with it. But I have four safety bags. I have a grab and go one without clothes. I have a grab and go one with clothes. I have one in my closet, by, in my house, and I have one in my trunk. 
and I gift them to those that I love. The reason why it's important to have one in your home is because if we're in a situation where we're shut in, you need to have your safety bags and containers and kits with the things you need. The reason why you need to have one in your trunk of your car is because when you're out in the home, out of the home, in the neighborhood, in the school, in the workplace, you need to have access to those things as well. So one thing I wanna do is share my screen because I only got about seven more minutes with you. Let's see if I can get this going right. Um, let me get my, let's see, am I sharing? Am I sharing? Am I sharing? Let me know. All right, we're up. You see me, Sister Darnisha is my, uh, my document. Okay, so number one, I want you to remember when you create your safety bags, it's okay to not break yourself and buy everything all at once. This is a work in progress and it's something that you chip away at gradually. I always suggest to make sure that number one, you have your medications, your emergency contacts and your doctor's information and even possibly your insurance. If the house burns down and you don't have access, you scramble around telling folks you have insurance, but do you have copies of those documents and are they sealed in plastic so that if you're having a weather hazard that includes water, those documents don't get destroyed. Of course, we're gonna update our bags every three to four months based on the seasons and the needs. So if you know you live in like New Orleans and there's constant flooding, you wanna make sure that you have your technological devices and things like that in plastic, okay? So make sure that you compartmentalize your bags according to the season. If you have a, a winter um, crisis and you haven't checked your bag since summer and all you have is flip-flops and shorts, you are not fully prepared. So make sure to customize your bags for your individual needs, but also go in and check them out through the seasons. Another reason why you're gonna check through your bags every three to four months is because those perishables and those nuts and those granola bars, they don't last forever. You wanna make sure that your medications and your foods are up to date so that you're not eating something that could also be a danger to you. So one thing that I like to do is, I like to tell everybody to compartmentalize your bag. Uh, one example and analogy that I use is, you know how if Big Mama tells you to reach into her purse and grab her her uh, cinnamon sticks or her 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 peppermints, and you digging through there and you 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 see a dead body, you see you see all kind of stuff, diapers, all kind of things. You don't want to have to go digging around. When we're in an emergency, it's a matter of seconds and minutes that can determine whether we respond in a speedy way. So make sure to compartmentalize your bag. There's gonna be at least five sections in your basic bag. Nutrition, comfort, relief tools, sanitation, and communication. And these are some of the basic starter things, but not limited to. In your nutrition compartment of your bag, you know exactly where that is. Meaning if big mama or little brother needs to reach for your bag, you say in the big pouch in the back is where the food is. You're gonna have water. You're gonna have a life straw especially if you don't keep water. A life straw you can get online for $19.99 from Amazon. And that means you can, it's a filtration tube that you can actually use in a pond or a body of water. If you need to suck up water, it will purify the water for you in an instant to drinkable water for you. You're gonna have nuts or trail mix. Be aware if you have allergies or someone else has an allergies to put dry snacks in there, that'll work. Uh, dried fruit. Oatmeal is something that can expand and give you uh, the, the nutrients you need to keep your belly full if you just add a little bit of water. Granola bars, a number one thing that I always remind you, if you don't have food, just get protein powder. You know, when you make your shakes, you can use vegan protein powder, vegetarian protein powder, whey protein powder, but I like to put them in little packages, Ziploc packages. If you don't have any food, you can add protein powder to your water, to your beverage, and instantly you have the protein you need if you're ever without nutrients. Peppermints are great, especially if you're dealing with somebody who has low sugar level and needs that punch of sugar. And then of course, there's something called MREs, for those of you who have served in the military, you know that those are called meals ready to eat. They last anywhere from five, 10, 15 years, and you get them at your local army surplus store. The next compartment that you're gonna have is for comfort. That is a hoodie, shirts, pants, socks, underwear. And don't put the old stuff you don't fit no more because ain't nothing like being in an emergency and being uncomfortable because you're trying to squeeze your butt in something that needed to go pass down to someone else. Make sure they're comfortable clothing, right? A pair of shoes. When you get rid of those old sneakers, if they're still good and they have soles, don't throw them away. Just pack them in your safety bags. A rain poncho to shield you. 
You can get that from the dollar store, right? A foil blanket that can keep you warm if you're in a cold environment, stuck on the side of the road and you're in the middle of nowhere traveling to see family in a quarantine, right? Uh, utility gloves, a tarp and mask. And again, a lot of these things are already in your homes or at dollar stores or discount stores. So you don't have to go broke. Uh, let's go ahead to the sanitation compartment of your bag. You need to have toilet paper. Y'all, we saw how crazy folks got over toilet paper. Folks was knocking and whopping each other over the head. So please make sure that you have your toiletries. For those who still are on their moons, make sure that you have sanitary napkins. And also sanitary napkins are just that. They're sanitary napkins. They can be used to sop up blood or clean up a situation if you need it, even outside of menstruation. Uh, plastic gloves. Uh, we know about that due to a lot of the hazards we're dealing with with germs. You want to have a first aid kit so that you can cleanse and bandage any wounds. Make sure you have, again, face masks, uh, washcloth, insect repellent. Think of the things you would need if you are going camping. If you're going camping, you need all the items that will give you the comfort necessary, right? And of course, a gentle reminder, your pet also needs things in their bag. Some of those are your pets, your furry friends as well. Uh, back to the list, soap, hand sanitizer, and rubbing alcohol to sanitize some dirty situations. We'll go on to relief tools. You need to have a Swiss army knife. I don't care if you figure out that you're a nonviolent person, it's still a tool you can cut, you can carve, and you can do things you need to do with that or a pocket knife. There's also things called fire strikers or starters that you can use to start a fire. Duct tape, and of course you had to build something or bind something together. Flashlights, and make sure you have fresh batteries. If, you're, if your batteries got crust on them, they are no good, ladies and gentlemen. When you check your bag every three to four months, get fresh batteries. Uh, making sure to have rope, matches, lighters, and zip ties. I always say zip ties are good if you need to clamp something on or have something bound to each other, or if you have an unsafe human or an animal, and I don't condone violence, I don't want you to hurt nobody, but if you need to put the clank clank on them until you get a safe situation going, zip ties are at the dollar store and they're a great way to keep things constrained or restricted or bound to you. And lastly, the communication department. This might be the one where you're actually invest a little bit more money into. A whistle. One thing that you can do with a whistle is that you can have nonverbal communication codes for different family members. If I blow the whistle one time long, that means meet at the back door, no questions, grab your safety bag. If I blow the whistle twice shortly, that means that there's an intruder coming in the back door. We need to meet at the front door. Uh, follow my drift with that and understand that nonverbal communication can be sent. And yes, Wanda, I can send this out so that you guys can have a free copy of this list, right? Uh, going forward in AM, FM radio, because your phones might not always have internet. The way the government run things, they love to make us dependent on things that they can easily take away. And if you're dependent on your phone, you might want to have a crankable AM, FM radio or batteries that are fresh that you can use, um, electronic chargers like this one, because when I plugged in, I did a presentation yesterday, I didn't plug in and charge my iPad. And so what did I do? I grabbed my portable charger, I plugged it in, and then you can move forward and plug in your devices if you're not around an outlet or a socket. Uh, making sure to just have a regular paper and pen. You might have to flee your house and because you've already decided in your predetermined um, uh, family plans or escape plans, you leave a note, we're at location number one. You do not write the location down just in case there's someone, uh, an unsafe person looking for you, but you have predetermined flee spots, predetermined places where you go to escape to and you can leave a note for your loved ones and let them know that might be big mama's house two miles away, right? And then last but not least, your medical information, your emergency contacts, your banking and insurance information checked and up to date every three to four months. So remember, it's all about having the basic tools and supplies, my kings and queens, making sure that you're prepared in advance. As we are moving forward and we're getting active with this way of life, which is highly threatening of our safety, we've got to make sure to, yes, meditate, yes, pray, yes, unify. But number one thing that I will always advocate for in our communities is for safety bags, safety plans, crisis awareness and prevention in place. I think I'm in time and on time because yes, we Africans can be in alignment with the time. That is my time, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure to uh, contact your page 
uh, at your church. I will make sure to have that so you can post it up and gift the gift that keeps on giving with your friends, families, and loved ones, which is safety preparedness and crisis prevention. Peace, my people. I love you. Thank you, Mariana. Did you guys hear that? Pray, meditate, but, but be prepared on top of all of that. Have that bag too. Um, so she's gonna make sure that we have a copy. I see she's already, our uh, brother Bill has already dropped that into the chat for you guys. Uh, we'll figure out maybe a way to get that on the website or have a link to it on the website as well. Um, thank you for that uh, very, very comprehensive um, talk uh, about some basic things that we can do to keep ourselves uh, safe in these interesting times. And, and it's relevant at all, all times are interesting times. Uh, and we have to stay prepared at all times. So with that, we have Sister Gloria is going to bless us with a song. Sister Gloria, would you please uh, come and share your gift with us? We're not hearing the sound, Emotep or Bill, we're not hearing it. Bill, you controlling that? She's not live, right? It's a recording. Yeah, but, and also uh, Gloria wanted to say something live. So can we go to her first? Sure, Sister Thank Gloria, you. would you like to speak? Thank you, Bob Ty. Greetings, greetings, Wose, Aunt Ujad Seneb. Um, this song is called Step Out on Faith that I co-wrote with um, Minister uh, Tahuti Kajimi back, I think somewhere around 2001, 2002, something like that. And um, uh, many of you may remember this song. So um, thank you for this opportunity to share it. Go ahead, uh, Baba Bill, Brother Bill. Come on, Rose, put your hands together. We stepping out on faith. Some of you may remember this song. I used to perform this with, uh, well, I wrote this song with uh, Minister Tahuti. the deserts, they cross the sea, they climb the mountains, prayed on their knees, they boarded trains, bled through fields, they slept in bonds with the dogs at their heels, can't see the road ahead, step out on faith instead. Don't know where it may lead. Loved ones behind they leave. They fought in war, died to be free. They fought the dogs, even fought the police. For little girls in church to pray. The church was bombed, they died that day. Can't see the road ahead. Step out on faith instead. Don't know where it may lead. Loved ones behind they. Today, we fight destruction, depravity. We fight to raise our families we fight for freedom to live as we choose yeah blessed with our past there's no way we can lose all right looks like uh we may have had a rather abrupt end to a very beautiful song there. 
Um, it looks like maybe Brother Bill may be having a little bit of a connection problem, but uh, Gloria, the song was beautiful. Maybe at the end, maybe we can replay the part that we uh, missed, but you all got it, right? You guys, you got the message that she was trying to deliver to us loud and clear, didn't you? I know I did. So thank you. Thank you. It is uh, always good to remind ourselves to sometimes step out on, on faith. Wow. I'm so sorry that that happened because the best is yet to come. Well, well, we're going to get it. it. It won't elude us. Well, it'll either come to us today or we'll have to get it next week, but it's not going to get away from us. I promise you, sister, we're going we gonna to get what you're trying to give to us. <laughs> All right. Thank and, you. and we have been blessed by what we've gotten already. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, Brother Bandaley, uh, ba excuse me, Brother Bama Daly. Brother Bama Daly is going to bring us our historical tribute uh, this week. Brother Ty, would you like to step in and give us your wonderful uh, introduction to the historical tribute? Okay, um, I just want to say real quickly that uh, each and every Sunday here at We'll Say we take the time out to pay honor, to pay tribute, to, uh, to, to pay homage to some person, place, or event from our past. And we do it because we know that if we don't take the time to remember what we have done, uh, it will be forgotten. Um, this morning, the tribute will be brought um, to us from uh, Brother Bama Daly, who is the curator of the African American Museum in downtown Oakland. So anybody who hasn't, anybody in the Bay Area who hasn't been there, go by and check out the museum and also check out my brother. Uh, this is his first tribute and I am very anxious to hear what he has to say. So Brother Bama Daly, the floor is all yours. Um, okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to see if I can uh, share my screen. Uh, we're gonna we have the video uh we if it's the same pictures that you sent me we have them we can play them for you if you want okay very good and now how do i oh okay okay i i, I would appreciate it if you would play them uh good morning we, uh today uh we are opening uh black history month and uh, this year we're focusing on unity. And so I want to focus on a person who definitely represents unity. And that is Makandal. Next slide. Um, uh, next slide, Makandal paying tribute to a freedom fighter from colonial Saint-Domingue, which is the former name of Haiti. Now, we know that rebellious men and women of African ancestry found ways to fight the institution of slavery uh, while they fiercely nurtured the desire for freedom and they fervently uh, anticipated self-governance. We know the names uh, Bukman Duty, Cecile Fatima, Toussaint Louverture, mm -hmm. Alexandre Pétion, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Henri Christophe, Mar uh, Marie-Jean Le Martinet, and Zabeth. We know their names as, uh, uh, in, in terms of the history of Haiti, especially as freedom fighters. But one name that we should never forget is um, uh, Francois Macandal. He does not always share the same prominence uh, in history that he deserves. And the image that you're looking at right now is, uh, is called Neg Mawon in uh, Haitian Creole. And that means the black maroon. And so we see uh, the, the uh, and this is by Albert uh, Mangones, uh, the sculptor and architect uh, from Haiti. And uh, we see that this freedom fighter holds a, a machete. And at the same time, he's issuing a call uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the conch shell as a uh, trumpet or the uh, lambi as it is called in Haitian Creole. Makandal was born around 1728 uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. He was, uh, and this is on, on the African continent. Next slide. And we see here uh, uh, the transatlantic tra uh, trafficking in African captives, uh, the so-called slave trade. And you see the, there's a gold arc and uh, he came from out one of two areas. 
Uh, you see Malinke, um, um, Malinke, and that's from one area in the Senegambia where he was thought to have come from. Malinke, uh, Malinke, Mali, uh, Mande, Mandekan, Mandingo are all the same people. Or if you look in the central area, you will see the Congo area. And so he was from either one of those or, 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 or two areas. And he was spirited off to, um, to Saint-Domingue. Saint-Domingue is now called Haiti, but it's just below Cuba on, uh, in the Caribbean. Okay. Um, he was kidnapped and brought uh, to Saint-Domingue. Uh, some scholars said that he had an aptitude for botanical lore when he was a child, but that would have been, uh, developed even more while he was in the Caribbean, because he also had to uh, had the task of tending to the animals uh, or the uh, stock that would be on the plantation, and he had to know how to take care of them in case they even got sick. Um, but as a boy, next slide. He witnessed, uh, uh, as, a, as a boy and a young adult, he witnessed that enslaved men and women on the plantation settlements were overworked. They were inadequately fed. They were uncomfortably housed and insufficiently provided medical care. Bonds men and women endured bodily maladies, psychological traumas and violent beatings. And repeatedly, one after another, they died very early deaths. And here we see them uh, uh, cutting uh, sugar cane. All right, next slide. Those trapped in this exploitative, stress-filled, inhumane new world uh, uh, obviously wanted some sense of release from oppression. They wanted a bonded servitude to end. They inspired. Uh, they. They aspired for a new life with profound changes. They wanted liberty. They wanted some semblance of home and family structure. And quite importantly, they wanted self-governance. And they turned to Vodou. And here we see some of the, uh, um, uh, this, even though this is a modern day image, um, but we see uh, people turn to their religion and found in their religion uh, a source of strength. Uh, and Vodou is a, me a mystical, mediumistic religion uh, that functioned in part as uh, for re revolutionary resistance, but it also uh, served as a revitalization movement. Uh, in the language of the Fon people, uh, Vodou quite, uh, and Fon is one of the African uh, uh, ethnic groups from um, West Africa, Vodou means uh, literally spirit but it also references sacred precincts, beliefs and devotional practices as well. Um, and Vodou as it emerged in the Caribbean really came from uh, West Africa and uh, Central African sources. As Makandal matured, he worked in the fields. Members of his community observed his charisma, leadership bearings, his organizational skills, gifted oratory, comportment as a religious leader. Some surmised that he was a marabou, that he was literate in Arabic and possessed arcane powers. Others, especially those who, uh, uh, those who think that he was from, the, um, from Congo, knew that of his familiarity with uh, Christianity because Christianity was in the Congo for many, uh, for many years. And to the extent that some called him the Black Messiah, and sometimes he even called himself the Black Messiah. But for most, he was an Ungan, that's O-U-N-G-A-N. Then that is a priest initiated into the, uh, the spiritual life and lore of Vodou. Next slide. Uh, the, uh, the impressive uh, uh, young field worker lost his hand or, or an arm in a sugar press. According to most accounts, this was the left appendage. Scholars have debated whether this was by accident or whether this was punishment. Uh, um, but we do not know uh, uh, how he, whether this was uh, punishment or whether this was an accident, but we do know that he was threatened with punishment uh, a little bit later in life. And this was because of his inclinations toward uh, a young woman on the planter who was a concubine 
of the planter or the plantation owner. And so he chose to run away into the forested mountains. And of, of course, you know that Haiti means high land. And so uh, it's a place that traditionally uh, has, has been filled with forested mountains. And those were the runaway, that, those were places where many of the people who ran away uh, sought refuge. The forested mountains offered him some sense of freedom and security, but Makanda believed the institution of slavery was a scourge. It needed to be exterminated along with its perpetrators. Makanda organized many of the numerous bands of in the mountains into a disciplined fighting regiments. He in contact with the cooperation of enslaved men and women, um, but he also contacted and made uh, good contact with the, uh, uh, a part of the free sector uh, plan unity this year and so my unifying figure. Uh, with a growing notoriety uh, as a menacing guerrilla fighter, Makandal also organized a plan to torch the uh, plantation estates, uh, especially in the northern part of the country. He did not have money to purchase guns, but he was a resourceful ungan uh, or a priest, and he uh, was a skilled botanist who knew how to make medicines. And the forests and the fields provided with him with ample uh, natural resources. Makandal was determined that African people would be free and self-governing. He would prepare batches of medicines to heal the land of the scourge called slavery. Medicines, he ordered, were to be placed in the water supply to render it fatal if consumed by humans or animals. Makandal instructed even enslaved men and women to medicate the medicines of the um, food and the refreshments that they served to the planters. But this was to be given to the, uh, uh, medicate the food and the refreshments of even enslaved men and women who they regarded as uncooperative. When he was uh, finally called, plantation after plantation had been burned and more than 6,000 persons who profited from the scourge of slavery had met their deaths. Makandal was the law, uh, but he used medicine. And there's a phrase in, in, in uh, Haiti, everything is poison, nothing is poison. Ulrich Jean-Pierre uh, painted this allegorical uh, work of art called Makandal Freedom Fighter. It presents the iconic figure and a band of runaways, both male and female, at a time when they sought nocturnal refugees, refuge in the moonlit a mist filled forest. In this natural environment, these fugitives from bonded servitude gathered raw materials and used African style mortars and pestles to prepare uh, the pharmacopoeia of revolt. And by pharmacopoeia of revolt, I mean the medicines that they would use to distribute across Saint Domingue. Uh, next slide. The central character of uh, uh, the central character in Jean Pierre's painting is the muscular one-handed amputee of the messianic uh, Makandal, a symbol of uh, uh, physical strength and moral certitude. He, uh, he is identified in this painting as a, a devotee of Ogun, or a shwal Ogu, to use the uh, uh, language in uh, the Creole language in Haiti. And shwal means horse, so he's the horse of Ogu, meaning that he can become possessed and mounted by the divinity Ogu who is the god of war, the god of iron uh, metals, uh, which are used to make war implements as well as uh, uh, implements to cultivate the soil. Um, and within his uh, immediate grasp, uh, there were machetes that we saw affixed to the tree. These are all symbols of war and the color red is, is the color of uh, the god of war in Haiti. And to the, uh, at the on the lower register of the, um, um, the slide we see the uh, uh, a bracelet uh, which is that contains the tools that were uh, described as Ogun's tools. Uh, we see the Ogun is worshipped among a number of people, and so we see this um, uh, this the character in the middle, the figure in the middle, but he's wearing a crown of medals that are. Uh, uh, 
uh, his uh, uh, tools. And we see uh, the tools that are surrounding the cauldron from Cuba. Uh, and these are two of Okun. And from the, uh, to the very far right, we see the tools of Okun that, are, that sits on the altars for Ogun. So in all of the black world, whether we're in uh, West Africa or the Caribbean, there is some sense of connection uh, to the similarities in which, uh, in which uh, uh, Ogun is depicted. Next slide, please. The French were disturbed that Mackendall, a runaway from slavery, dared to assert his humanity. Labeled a murderer uh, by the French authorities, Mackendall became the uh, focus of a dragnet operation. The painting by uh, uh, Fritz uh, Zephyrin visually retells a well-known story uh, uh, of, the, of the capital punishment that awaited the incarcerated guerrilla fighter on the 20th of January, 1758. Over the years, Mackendall had taken many chances. Uh, and in fact, he had been captured many times, but he always escaped. But this time the French colonists reasoned that the reviled murderer would pay with his life. And so in the middle of the town of Cap Francais, it's now known today as Cap Haitien, uh, and it's near the citadel, um, the authorities assembled a sizable audience to witness, uh, and this uh, 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 sizable audience include enslaved men and women, as well as free planters. They, uh, they wanted to create a, a spectacle where Mackendall would be burned at the stake. But Mackendall had already told the, uh, many of the enslaved people that if he were ever to be captured, they wouldn't be able to hold him, that he would escape, uh, he would escape he would uh, become a shapeshifter, if you will. Uh, and that is, he would change from a uh, human form into an animal form, and that he would become a bird and fly away, or an insect, specifically a mosquito. Now, one of the functionaries went forward and lit the fire to burn Mackendall. But to their great astonishment, the stake unexpectedly broke and disrupted the inferno. The reputed Vodou priest uh, leaped from the fire. The crowd roared with excitement. And in a state of consternation, the authorities quickly dispersed everybody that they had assembled. In the aftermath of the attempted execution fiasco, two narratives emerged. The story touted by the French maintained that they retied a Mackendall to the stake as originally intended and summarily executed him by fire. But another account circulated throughout the community of enslaved people. That report affirmed that Mackendall, tr true to his word, became a shapeshifter and he escaped by flying away. Uh, but equally significant, there was another part uh, um, to the account. And that was that the uh, enslaved, the formerly enslaved Mackendall, the free man, the runaway, the person who, um, um, vowed vengeance uh, and revenge upon those who enslaved him, that he would pursue those uh, over the course of the years and, uh, uh, and exacted punishment on, um, um, uh, on the former, uh, on those who were still continued to enslave. Now, many people, the French were obsessed with uh, describing Mackendall as a failure and so many of the reports today still continue to echo that, that he failed in what he attempted to do. But he was a unifier. And so that was in 1758, uh, uh, when they claimed to have killed him, Toussaint Louverture would have been a boy. And those who his, uh, his contemporaries, whose names I called earlier, uh, uh, Duke, uh, Bukman Duti, uh, Cecile Fatima, and the others would have been children at that time. And what he did was to inspire them to achieve what he knew that they always could be. They could always be free people. They could always have families that were intact and they could always practice their, their own religion. And so Mackendall, in other words, did not fail, but he inspired a later generation to achieve the freedom and self-governance that he always preached was possible. So strong as was is the name Mackendall in Haiti today, that it is synonymous with protective amulet or a talisman, 
so when people have converted his name to a uh, part of the lexical a, uh, lexical item used in their language to refer to that which is powerful. Now, uh, before I close, I want to just make a, a couple of comments. Every time I engage in research, I always ask myself, what did I learn from the, uh, uh, from the obvious facts uh, and impressions rendered by the story? First, we have been taught to use the language of, the, uh, of those who disparage the achievements of our ancestors. We often use the word slave when enslaved is perhaps more appropriate. We often use a, a phrase uh, African slave trade when in fact the European trafficking in African captives is more appropriate. And we often use the word maroon to characterize the fierceness with which our ancestors struggle to be free. But whether we say maroon in English, mawon in Haitian Creole, or cimarron in Spanish, it means that which is wild, undomesticated, feral, untamed, or savage. Why would we characterize our freedom loving ancestors as wild? And that's a question that we have to raise to ourselves today. What lessons do we learn from our struggle? Why would we call our ancestors wild? Uh, using the language of, uh, uh, of our oppressors. We are indeed the descendants of the lions. And we know that, the, that uh, there's a story that the story of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the contestation that always takes place will honor those of the hunter rather than the lions. But we have to walk with the understanding that indeed we are lions and it is our duty to transmit uh, and to make intelligible the profound roar of the lion because it contains our worldview, our insights and our victories. The hunters, the enslavers need not have the last word on our story. We have to take the responsibility to do that. Thank you so very much. And uh, in the spirit of unity or umoja, I submit to you that we must honor uh, Mark and Tom. Thank you. Oh. Mm. Thank you so much. Uh, I see, I see, Thank I you. Yes, yes, yes. This is what happens when we have these incredible scholars here uh, in our midst, giving us this high level, incredible uh, mm -hmm. information uh, right yes. here in the middle of our, our worship services. Thank you so much. Uh, for that information. Thank you for enlightening us, for holding all of that incredible knowledge and brilliance inside your head and, and then sharing it uh, with our family. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Did he say the video is available at the museum? Uh, no, it is not. These are essentially slides that I've uh, pulled together. But I hope to make a video at some point in the future and I hope to publish the article at some point. This is based on an article that I wrote for a couple of conferences. Thank you. Minister Makalisi, can you follow <laughs> that up with one of your songs? I see, I see. I just give thanks and praises for this opportunity. Thanks and praises for that uh, uh, very inspiring, informative uh, historical tribute. And uh, that question at the end about what are we calling ourselves, our heroes, our people, whose language are we using? We need to do some study and decide uh, what term, if there's one term that can decide that. Uh, Shay. So yeah, I'd like to share this, this, this song with you uh, <clears throat> and uh, just give thanks and praises for, for life, health, and strength, for the Wolsey community, for the spirit of mind, for the power of Except heavy, just whew, on and on and on. But uh, here we go. <clears throat> the Lord is blessing us right now, right now. The Lord is blessing us right now, right now. Ra woke us up this morning, started us on our way. Amen Ra is blessing us right now. 
Ra woke me up this morning, clothed in my right mind, and didn't wake me up too late. Ra woke me right on time, woke me up this morning, started me on my way. I'm in Ra is blessing me right now. Ra wakes us up each morning to work, study, and pray. Puts our feet on the holy ground of the sacred African way. I feel Ra's love and power here this very hour. Amen Ra is blessing us right now. Right now, right now, right now, right now. Amen Ra is blessing us right now. Right now, right now, right now, right now. Amen Ra is blessing us right now. Ra wakes us up each morning in the spirit of my. Let's us see the sacred way, the potential that we've got with the vision of life, free of despair and strife. Amen Ra is blessing us right now. Yeah. The Lord is blessing us right now, right now. Amen Ra is blessing us right now. Right now, Ra woke us up this morning for the sacred African way. Amen, Ra is blessing us right now. Amen, Ra is blessing me right now. Yeah. Amen, Ra is blessing you right now, right now. Amen, Ra is blessing us right now. Let's rise up in the spirit of my rise up with septipi power. We gotta rise up and teach our children every day and every hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen Ra is blessing us right now, right now. Yeah. Amen Ra is blessing us right now. Ra woke us up this morning, started us on our way. Amen Ra is blessing us right now. Oh, yeah. Amen Ra is blessing us right now. Wow. Ashe. Ashe, Ashe. Never disappointed when Minister Makalisi brings us uh, these songs that uh, there seems to be an endless stream of them that just come forth from him. Thank you for letting that river flow across our ears. And now uh, we come to the uh, part of our service where we take care of our, our business and support ourselves financially. Um, I'd like to call Mama Angina and Baba Ustadi to uh, bring us the litany of sacrifice. And good morning, good morning uh, once again to everyone. Um, we will, uh, the screen is up and everything has been absolutely wonderful thus far. Sister Mariana, that historical tribute was just awesome. So this is a time where we can share those blessings that the Most High has given us and we can give back to support our community. Our buildings still stand, the PGE and the water are still on. So we still have to continue to um, pay our litany and tithes and to share that which we have. So all together now, let us say, save us, O Holy One, by your name. Vindicate us by your might. Hear my prayer, divine protector. Listen to the words of my mouth. How can we repay the Holy One for the gifts that have been given to us? We will lift up the cup of salvation 
and call on the God of our ancestors. We will fulfill our vows to our creator and the presence of all our people. Gladly, Most High, we bring our sacrifices to you. We will praise your name, O Amun-Ra, for it is good. It is good. Umoja, our first principle, unity. We shall strive to maintain unity and the family, community, nation, and race. Kuji Chagalia, self-determination. We shall define, name, create, and speak for ourselves. Ujima, collective work and responsibility. We shall build and maintain our communities together. Our brothers and sisters' problems shall be ours to solve together. Ujima, cooperative economics. Together we shall build and maintain our own businesses and together profit from them. Nia, purpose. We must have purpose. We shall make our collective vocation, the building and development of our community and the restoration of our people to our traditional greatness. Kuumba, creativity. We shall do as much as we can in any way we can to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than when we inherit. Faith, Imani, faith. We can do nothing without faith. We must know that the Most High has our backs and that is called faith. We shall believe with all our hearts in our creator, our people, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. And absolutely. Baba. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, ancestors who are listening and praying and watching over us, we give thanks for this day. We give thanks for those who have something to give. And we have, we give thanks for those who had only their hearts and love, time and inspiration to give and those who wanted but could not give. But most of all, we know that if we're together in the darkness and we're together in the light, there's no beautiful thing than sacrifices with what you got, and that's our time, talent, and our money. But for those who have given, we give thanks. For those who have not given, we give thanks. And most of all, we give thanks and blessings for all of those because we know there's no beauty except in relationship. Unity. I say, I say, I say. Thank you. And the different ways that you can contribute, Brother Bill, thank you, has put on the screen. You can um, send to Wolse we'll Oakland as well as Wolse we'll Sack. We have um, several different ways of the, the new um, quick things that you can send money, the Zales and quick pays and all that. So we have several ways to contribute and we thank you, thank you, thank you, Ashe. Thank you, Mama Angina. Thank you, Baba Ustadi uh, for leading us in that litany. Thank you for all of our family members who have contributed or even those who wish to contribute uh, and don't have the means. Uh, all of the ways that we support uh, our organization are appreciated um, and valued. And I believe that we are going to have, we're gonna to try to finish up that special treat. Is uh, Sister Gloria. Okay, um, I guess I, I'm gonna, uh, please be in agreement with me that I will be able to share my screen and play the remainder of the video. Gloria. We're gonna step out on faith. Gloria, I was, yes. to, I was going to play your video. Oh, you're going to play. Okay, that'll be wonderful. Thank okay. you. Okay, let me let me um, let me try that. Hold on, just a second. And I remember that song too. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Mama and Gina. <laughs> this is especially for Rose. 
Come on, Rose. Put your hands together. We stepping out on faith. Some of you may remember this song. I used to perform this with, uh, well, I wrote this song with uh, Minister Tahuti. And the ladies sing. They cross the deserts, they cross the sea. They climbed the mountains, prayed on their knees. They boarded trains, fled through fields. They slept in bonds with the dogs at their heels. Can't see the road ahead. Step out on faith instead. Don't know where it may lead. Loved ones behind they lead. They fought in war, died to be free. They fought the dogs, even fought the police. For little girls in church to pray. The church was bombed. They died that day, can't see the road ahead. Step out on faith instead. Don't know where it may lead. Loved ones behind they. Today, we fight destruction, depravity. We fight to raise our families we fight for freedom to live as we choose yeah blessed with our past there's no way we can lose can't see the road ahead step out on faith instead don't know where it may lead Loved ones behind they leave. Talking about Harriet Tubman, y'all. Talking about Miss Rosa Parks, y'all. Talking about the Honorable Mr. Marcus Garvey, y'all. We're talking about Mr. Malcolm X. They cross the deserts. They cross the sea. Cross the sea. They climb the mountains, prayed on their knees. On their knees. They boarded trains, fled through fields. They slept in bonds with the dogs at their heels. Can't see the road ahead. We're talking about Mr. Langston Hughes. Step out on faith instead. We're talking about Madam C. J. Don't Walker. know where it. May leave. I'm talking about Zora Neale Love Hurston. ones behind they leave. I'm talking about Miss They cross the deserts. They cross the sea. I'm talking about Ma They Ray climb Ray the Yo. mountains. Prayed on their knees. I'm talking about Mr. Medgar they boarded Everest. trains. Fled through fields. Talking about the honorable They Mr. slept John in bonds with Lewis, the dogs Senator at their heels. Can't see the road of it. Step out on faith instead. We're talking about Don't Mr. know Hank where Aaron. it may lead. We're talking about Ms. Love Andrew ones Hanger. behind All they the leave. Fighters. We're talking about Ms. They Cecily cross the deserts. They cross the seas. We're they climb the mountains. President prayed Barack on their knees. Obama. They boarded We're trains, fled through fields. They slept in bonds with dogs at their heels. Can't see the road ahead. Step out on faith instead. I don't know where it may be. The ones behind they leave. They cross the deserts, they cross the seas. They climb the mountains, prayed on their knees. They boarded trains, fled through fields. They slept in bonds with the dogs at their heels. 
eyes can't see the road ahead. Step out on faith instead. Don't know where it may lead. Blessings, Rose. Thank you. Love it. All right, we got that all the way through. What a what a beautiful song. That's what we were treated to back in the day in Sacramento. We're glad that Sister Glow is back with us. Mama Darnisha. Thank you. thank you, thank you. Stepping out on faith successfully. And now it is uh, the part that you all came for, that word of the day in honor of Black History Month, our word today is being brought to us by Professor Manu Ampen. And we're supposed Professor to Manu, would you so uh, introduce, so I turn on your mute, and Professor Manu, would you mind introducing your topic to us? Welcome. Uh, thank you, Sister Darnisha, and uh, good morning, good afternoon. We'll say I'm going to address uh, the topic of the day. There's no other topic to address other than the great Carter G. Woodson and the origin of African Heritage Month. I mean, what else is there to address? So uh, that's my uh, pleasure and task to really share with you uh, some of what I have learned over the decades. Can you turn up the volume? About one of the greatest men in the uh, 20, 20th century. Brother Maynu, uh, yeah. your, your volume is very low. Can you um, uh, somehow uh, speak closer to the microphone? Okay, hold on, let me change. Hold on for a minute. No, there you go. Okay, how's the sound? Much better. Okay. All right. So uh, anyway, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, we'll say there's no other topic to address today other than the uh, great Carter G. Woodson and the origins of African Heritage Month. And so I'll share just some of the insight of what I've learned over the last several decades about one of the greatest men in the uh, 20th century and you know, people know about Carter G. Woodson, but they don't know about Woodson. I remember back some years ago, I was doing presentations at different colleges here in California. And uh, it was one particular year that February was quite busy. I don't know if it was the leap year or not, but I do remember that there were a lot of requests. And I learned something that every group, whether it was a Black Studies uh, Association or BSU or any kind of group, I noticed that none of them knew the reason for the season. They didn't know the reason for the occasion and none of them had heard of Carter G. Woodson. Even if they had heard of him in a distance, they didn't know much about him. So I recognized that was part of my job as a professional historian is to make sure that that would not continue, that people would not know the reason for the season, the reason why people focus on February so uh, I'm gonna show some slides and then really address the topic of Woodson. And I know many of you in the Wolseg community, you're quite familiar with Woodson and his work, but I wanna share with you even more insight than what you might be familiar with. And that's what, um, that's what my task is. So uh, let me show the slide. So it's Woodson and the Origins of African Heritage Month. Now, I remember at uh, Contra Costa College where I've been teaching for some time when I told the folk we, we need to change it from Black History Month to African Heritage Month. And one of the uh, committee members, she didn't take kindly to embracing Africa. So she uh, sent me an email later after the event, after uh, we've successfully changed the title. And she told me, she said, you know, Carter G. Woodson would be turning over in his grave that I, changed it from Black History Month to African Heritage Month. And then to try to soften her, her uninformed words, she said, but I love you, he, 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 ha, ha, ha. So I decided, let me send her an email back and said, actually, Carter G. Woodson will be quite excited in his grave that I've taken up the mantle to continue the work that he began during his lifetime that is systematically ignored by those that have not read anything about Woodson. So I listed a few books and articles that he wrote focusing on African civilizations. And so after I told her what time it is, then I said, ha, 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 he, 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 I love you too. So let's move on. So her response was not to respond <laughs> because documentation beats conversation every day of the week. So there was no more discussion. So Woodson 
obviously is one of the greatest uh, men of his time in terms of helping us recover from historical amnesia. But when we really read the records of Woodson, I mean, it's quite a body of work that he left behind. And he's, he's a scholar's scholar. I mean, literally his parents were born in the enslavement period, but he himself turned out to be one of the greatest thinkers and writers and producers that we've seen. And I, I actually found uh, this photo of Woodson in 1931 here at the bottom when he visited my alma mater, Morgan State University. And every time you see Woodson, he is he's suited, he's serious about the mission, even in this particular image that you see there at the bottom. But here, these are some of the accomplishments of, of Woodson and some of just a thumbnail sketch of his work and contribution. So these are the years that he uh, he lived, but obviously his work has lived, lived on far beyond his days uh, here on the planet. But these are some of the attributes in, um, and in contributions of Woodson as a historian and educator. He wrote more than a dozen books. He's the founder of, uh, of uh, the Association for the Study. Then it was called Negro Life and History. Now it's African-American Life and History. And he began his work, uh, his life-saving work immediately. Uh, they founded the journal in 1916. Now it's the leading journal of black historians in the country today, the Journal of African-American History. Maybe if we have time, I might say something about the recent issues with uh, this journal. The journal, and then he founded Negro History Week, or now we is African Heritage Month today, and he founded the uh, so-called Negro History Bulletin. Now it's the Black History Bulletin, uh, Af African American History Bulletin for teachers, and then we are in the 95th annual celebration of African Heritage Month. And uh, I'll explain why he would be quite excited about us embracing the, the whole month long presentation and, and actually celebration. One thing about Woodson is that he did not take kindly to uh, ignorant people or people spreading ignorance among the community. He was hard and harsh on those folks. I'll give you some of his quotes in a minute, but as he was the one uh, in the forefront along with his organization to promote uh, what we now consider and understand as African Heritage Month, it was a collective effort and Woodson knew that it was a major struggle because there were many people who were spreading falsehoods in the community and he was hard and harsh on them because he understood that that made the work more difficult. Now, a lot of you are aware that the week was founded in the second week of February because black people had been honoring Lincoln, whose birthday is on February 12th, and then they had been honoring Frederick Douglass since he passed in 1895. His birthday is February 14th. This is why Woodson chose the second week in February not to celebrate individual men. He recognized that it didn't make a lot of sense to try to create a new time period to get Black people to celebrate and embraced themselves. So he took advantage of the momentum that was already taking place. That's why he chose the second week in February, but his goal was to shift from the focus on individuals to a great race. That's what his focus was. And he, and he recognized that there needed to be a week initially, but what Carter Woodson understood is the week would simply be a time period where people will simply be demonstrating and sharing what they learn all year round. So for him, it was really about an entire year focusing on, on African contributions in the, in the Americas. So for him, it was about the missing pages, missing chapters and missing volumes that needed to be replaced. And he, it's, for him, it wasn't just a separate history that was necessary. It was really about integrating the unique black contributions in the US and the world into the, not only the history of the US, but the history of world civilization. And that was part of his work. So even though the week was founded in 1926, Woodson had presented the idea and was promoting the idea some years earlier. And so in 1920, the Omega Sci-Fi fraternity, which he was a member, he was challenging them to do something, say something teach, learn, promote the history. So they actually took on the call. And a couple of years before 1926, they actually formed and, and organized Negro History and Literature Week. But Woodson didn't think it was enough. So he went on to found a week through his organization 
of the Association for the Study. Now it's called African American Life and History. So it was an organizational focus then that even now more than a century later, it is still in the forefront of promoting the, uh, the focus and celebration. And so Woodson recognized this organization needed to take on this call because he, he said there were so many of these uh, people spellbounded by ignorance, people running around giving lectures and they didn't know anything. Let me give you some of the quotes and some of the harshness that Woodson gave because believe it or not, and you all are very informed, the same type of characters are running around today being promoted as some great historians and thinkers, and they're not that. And I guarantee Woodson would be highly critical of those that are not using primary sources and original sources, but they take advantage of the times uh, of, of February. So he said, do not call in some silver tongue orator to talk to your school about the history of the Negro. The orator does not generally have much in his head. His chief qualification is strong lungs and, uh, um, and good bellows. <laughs> <laughs> he also said that these were pseudo historians uh, running around. He called them imposters. He said that these were misinformants and, and that the community should boycott these uh, mischievous orators. And trust me, folks, as a professional historian who's trained in firsthand research methods, I guarantee you there's just as many, if not more today than there was in his day. But people don't necessarily see it because there's not a lot of Woodsons around who are trained to really uh, challenge this kind of nonsense. But anyway, uh, this is the theme for this year. His organization, they set the theme. This is 95th annual celebrations to black family representation, identity and diversity. So they set the theme and for some years now, you know, every president, they recognize it, uh, you know, nationally. And so people run with, uh, with the theme, but I'll, I'll uh, discuss that a little bit more. So how did Woodson get the word out? I mean, what was his focus? It's one thing to have a celebration, but it's also, it's, it's something more important to not just have a celebration for uh, some folks to come out and learn, but how do you bring the knowledge to the people? So Woodson was a practical historian and a practical scholar who didn't just talk in the ivory towers. He was a man of the people. So these are some of the areas or some of the, the ways, the methods in which he he, uh, he presented. So public lectures were important because he wanted to make sure that those silver tongue orators were not out there misinforming the public. You know, one of the things that I did some years ago, I wrote an article about the, uh, about information viruses. We hear about viruses and now we're in a pandemic, but there's information viruses, not just computer viruses. So I say there should be a law against the spread of ignorance. And so that law has to first start in our community. People should be, uh, there should be a penalty for the spread of ignorance. So this is why Woodson, I'll tell you, gave public lectures in order to get the right information out there by people that he trained. But not only that, but teacher lesson plans. That's why he formed the Negro History Bulletin. This is very important for him. Also, they raised money to get posters in the hands of families and teachers and uh, made sure that there were plays given out for history performances. There were black history clubs formed and city after city after city. And for those schools that didn't really have money, he created the, 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 the history kits with, with writings and speeches and plays. And he charged them only $2 for the history kit. Then he added a little bit more to it. And it, it was only $2.50 for a whole school, $2.50 for the, the history kit. And uh, outside of that, and in addition to that, he created, along with his organization, they created the, the home study department to have a correspondence course. So if you can't come to us, we're going to come to you. And he took that seriously. He made sure that everybody understood and that they knew that the home study department was uh, also meeting high level academic standards because he was serious about making sure that he reached the masses of the people. And you know what, for Woodson, he said that publishing, this is very important, publishing the truth is self-defense. He always talked about intellectual self-defense and winning, and so I would call it winning the idea battle. So he published the Journal of uh, Negro History, now is at Journal of African American History, the leading journal in the country for Black folks in the U.S. And so many issues, it could, this comes out quarterly, and it's still being published today of uh, more than 100 years. This is a recent issue here 
you have uh, C.T. Vivian and John Lewis in this, but for him, it was about self-publishing. That was one of the big things for Woodson. So Associated Publishers was the publication wing of the association. And so in the Negro History Bulletin, this was always focused on helping teachers. And after he passed, they, they ran some issues in his honor, but it was a broad ranging focus with the bulletin to make sure that the teachers were able to teach because one who learns teaches and for him, we can't have people uninformed teaching the youth. So he did something about it. And that's why the bulletin was one of the keys to the distribution of knowledge for, uh, for Carter G. So some of his publications, he focused on uh, individual achievements, but he's more interested in the group. So many publications, over a dozen or so, this one here, The Negro in Our History, became one of the most important textbooks for some years. It was a standard text. It was a pioneering text to show and present and, and, and document Black contributions. And this was the early 20th century. This was literally a century ago, where very few people knew much of anything about the experience of of black people. So Woodson was uh, was going against the tide on a regular and consistent basis. And this is all before, by the way, he created that week. So there was building momentum of black people learning more and more. Keep in mind in 1920s, you got the Harlem Renaissance, you got an intellectual uh, uh, movement taking place. And Woodson understood that he had to catch up with and get in front of that if he was going to have the, the valuable impact that he needed to have. And that's why it was important for him to create a number of ways in which he could impact the knowledge base of Black people. A lot of you know about the miseducation. He's talking about these people who don't know anything about themselves. If they stayed too long in school, the public school system, then they would be a hopeless liability to their race. It is one of the classics. You can read it and we would think it was just a year or two ago, but how many of you know about what his organization calls Woodson's Appeal? Now, this is a book that is very important because Woodson never published this. The association calls it Woodson's Appeal. It was never published. He had wrote it in 1921, but never published it. What did he call it? And why didn't he publish it? Well, he called it The Case of the Negro. And the reason why Woodson never, even though he wrote it, didn't publish it. And by the way, this was just found um, in around 2005. So this unpublished manuscript was found by the association uh, member, uh, the president found it, and, uh, and then they published it and they changed the title to the appeal. But Woodson was, was he had an uns, unswerving criticism of a racist and white supremacist and bigots and white nationalists, but he decided not to publish it because some of the financial support would have drawn, you know, it, it would have uh, it would have gone dry, because he did have some philanthropists for a period of time helping the organization. So it was kind of a strategic move not to publish the uh, the case of the Negro. And if you read that, you'll see that uh, it was a stunning indictment of America. And so you think that uh, that the uh, uh, miseducation is a tough text. You check out the case of the Negro, but but more than that, this great scholar, as he makes his contributions, obviously now people have honored Woodson. There's a 20 cents. There was a 20 cent stamp in his honor a few decades ago because of his ongoing work. And what Woodson was having to do is not only make sure that these um, silver tongue orators and these uh, misinformed people were out there, but he also had to challenge the white scholarship like George Hagel, Arnold Toynbee, who said basically that black people had no history that anybody should ever read. There's no history worth even reading. So Woodson was challenging all of these false claims. And he said that, you know, that, uh, that one propaganda book would require black people to write maybe 12 books and do tons of work to try to try to overcome the propaganda because they had a greater distribution network and a bigger audience. So for every propaganda book, every propaganda article, it, it required a response. And again, for him, you know, publishing the truth, this was self-defense. This is why he could not do it alone. He created an organization. And that's why it's, 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 uh, it's unwise for Black folks to continue to focus on individuals. We usually focus on individuals. 
but understand that the group is more important than the individual. And Carter G. Woodson never promoted himself. Carter G. Woodson used the organizational apparatus that he created to, to promote his life's work. He, he, he didn't marry, but guess what? He was married to his work. It's important to understand that the, the organizations are always a, what allow the individuals to do their work. So we should be more broad in our understanding and focus on organizations and not individuals. Everything we do, every talk, every study, even uh, whatever we may present, even if the individual was clearly the leader, we must look at the organizational structure that he or she created or came out of. Otherwise, we're not moving in a tradition that would be most effective. Why is Woodson's work lasting over a century? Because his organization continues to work. And that's what he had to do in order to uh, challenge these propagandists. So he makes a tremendous contribution. One of the things we can say about Woodson is that for him, it was to make black people the subject of our own experience and not the object of somebody else's contempt. There's a difference between the subject and the object. And he made sure that we were the subject and we were the producers of what we needed to say about ourselves. And that's why the Associated Publishers was a key to the work of Woodson. You had an independent publishing wing within his, um, his work. So what, what about the achievements? What was he focused on? What did he think would be or should be the, the effort and the perspective? So it wasn't just some empty celebrations. He really did want to look at achievements. So we can't just look at, as we know, I'm sure, the last few hundred years. So Woodson more and more started to look beyond our experience here in the US. He started to go beyond slavery. And he, his other books, I call them, because people are not too familiar with them, Woodson began to systematically write about and study African civilizations. So to discuss Woodson, it, we have to discuss Africa. So African myths and folk tales. As a matter of fact, look at the last two books that Woodson wrote. The last two, the African background outline, or an introduction to the study of black people and then African heroes and heroines. These are the last two books that Woodson wrote because this is now what he's focused on. It's not about just individuals who were able to overcome slavery. And so for him, by the way, the focus on, on, um, on African uh, tradition and, and, and even African Heritage Month, it wasn't about, as he criticized people he said, you know, these people run around and speak and lecture all the time. All they know is uh, how black people were fighting diligently, uh, you know, against white supremacy or racism. And he said that they don't know anything else. They don't know anything about achievements. So Woodson challenged this idea that whenever black folks talk, it's about something negative. He said, you're not the problem and you're not the problem. So why are you focusing on the problem all the time? And so uh, that's what we do at our college at Contra Costa. I was just before we started, I see that people are emailing me because I sent the flyer out to everybody and, and people calling, calling me trying to see if uh, they can do an event this month. No, we have the official calendar. And why are you contacting me in February to see if you can have an event? No, uh, we don't endorse anything other than what we promote because we are about a focus on achievements, contributions, a celebration of African culture. So if you want to deal with who got beat up last week, who got slapped by the police, and, and uh, who got into a fight and all of that, those have relevance, but not when we're promoting the best of ourselves. So we don't let you just present us as a problem. We're not a problem. We are the ones who are the first ones who created a solution to the human experience. We're the ones that stood up and taught everybody what it meant to be human. We're the ones that created the, the, uh, the first organized civilizations with the small stature people. They're the ones that taught us how to be the great ecologists that you do unto nature as you would, do, as you would have nature do unto you. And so these are the ones who are highly civilized. Now, if you wanna talk about Kush and Nubia and Kemet, those are not the first civilizations. If you wanna say they're the first advanced civilizations, then that's fine. But the search civilization are those that created civilized, organized societies. And so we have to look at all of these, these, uh, these models and these groups. And so I tell people, we don't focus, when we're dealing with embracing February, we don't let you come in and, 
and yet it's another negative experience because as Woodson said, even in his day, they don't know anything else other than something on the news or somebody complaining about this or complaining about that. For us, it's achievements. And so for Woodson to embrace Africa is because for him, that's when we look at the apex of human achievement. That's when we look at when we set the model, the, the guide, the standard for achievements in the world. How in the world, as Kwame Ture say, can, can people do anything meaningful? Because if they start their history in slavery, the best they can be is a good slave. And Woodson went beyond that. So like I told the, the woman in the email, you need to read the books. You need to understand Woodson. You were afraid of Africa, not Woodson. He focused on our achievements and contributions. And this is the tradition that we're going. So when people are talking about Black History Month, they typically, they typically mean the experience of Black people only in the US. It's a limited perspective. And so he embraced Africa and so do we. So we call it African Heritage Month. And just so everybody understands our focus in parentheses, we'll say Black History Month, but it is Africa. Some people can't say African. So the best they could do, I heard them this month, they say African American History Month, no African History Month, but I'll give it to you. At least you got Africa in there somewhere. You know, I found this article too, 1939. Take a look at this, the Negro in art from Africa to America. So he's talking about contributions, art, architecture. And, and so this gets missed. This is Negro history, but this is 1939. And so Woodson is beginning to focus specifically on Africa. How could anybody be a legitimate uh, protector of the Woodson legacy and then not even embrace in Africa? So we have to shift our language. I would suggest that we call it African Heritage Month and challenge everybody to get on board where, where Woodson was three quarters of a century ago. So also take a look at Woodson's articles. I showed you his books. Look at his articles. These are, hey, please hear me well. You remember what year Woodson passed? 19, what, 50. Take a look at these articles. These are the last three articles that Woodson wrote in his lifetime, a three-part series on Egypt. So he's beginning to learn. He's a pioneer. And so he's beginning to embrace Africa with, with books, with uh, learning materials, and now with articles to get it out there. The Negro History, History Bulletin, remember this is for teachers. And so he's talking about the Nile Valley. Now remember, these are the early uh, work and ideas. So he's, he's not clear on everything, but he's moving in the right direction. So this is the area that Woodson's talking about. I mean, how many of you, and you are most, look folks, Wilson, let's be clear about this. You are most, you're among the most informed group in the country. Think about that. You're, mo you're among the most informed group in the country. And how many of you knew about these articles? How many of you even have the, uh, the Woodson books? Now, if you don't have it, you see where the masses of people are at. So this is why we have to lead by example, embrace Woodson's real legacy. Because uh, if you take a look at some of those academics in his organization and, and in some of these other areas, there's some great people, there's some good people, but then there's some people you just shake your head and you say, you know what, I can see why these people would never embrace Africa. Look at look at their point of view and perspective. So we cannot let them, uh, they don't own Woodson's legacy. We need to liberate the man's legacy. So he's looking at the Nile Valley. And so he understood something. He understood that 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 Kush that, uh, and, Ethi and Nubia were actually forerunners of Egypt. He says that. So we understand that he understands uh, in some of his writings that that uh, Kemet came afterwards from the after these other civilizations and that that uh, you look at his third bullet point that it was these Nile Valley civilizations and black people at the forefront of the world's original enlightenment. He actually makes those arguments. How about that? Who's teaching that at any time? Not just in February. So for me, really, if you look at Woodson, he talked about not just a week but a month, but a whole year. He said, you're not doing your job if in February, your goal is just to try to bring, bring in the big time speaker who he criticizes as simply making money, earning cash at the expense of the uninformed masses of people who are not doing their job of learning throughout the year. This focus should just be to demonstrate what we're learning. And so he's really focused. So Woodson is not clear on everything. Uh, he's really not but he's moving in the right direction. So he says that on the one hand that these are, he says, look, uh, Egypt, the country was originally settled by so-called Negroes or black, instead of Negroes, the term now is Africoid. So he says Africoid people, he says that, but then take a look at uh, 
he also says that the very beginning there's the there was some uh there, there's some admixture and then he goes on look at the third bullet point i don't know what this means uh he said negroid mixed breeds <laughs> so woodson is uh he's kind of back and forth but he's moving in the right direction remember now he's a pioneer we're talking early 20th century he understood and so if you take some of his quotes he's very clear about the african foundation for the civilization and he in that article i showed he's talking about um you know they're talking about the uh in uh, the waset area uh heru and market he's talking about some of the actual monuments so he's clear but it's kind of like he's not consistent with all of his writings but he's a pioneer that pointed people in the right direction. And he, he, he prioritized the significance of Africa. That's why Chancellor Williams had to come in and help out a little bit, <laughs> who was born, you know, after Woodson and, and Chancellor Williams then put helps to put the record straight. And so when Woodson is discussing and focusing on um, these African civilizations and contributions in Kemet, he's definitely moving in the right direction because see Woodson had never traveled to do the field work, but as a scholar, he was able to look at records and make a scholarly assessment. This is why he embraces uh, what he called Ethiopia or Kush, Nubia, and even Kemet as African civilizations. And so, um, you know, Woodson, what if Woodson, one of the great intellectuals of our time, what if he actually knew that this is a papyrus plant? What if he actually knew at that time that from papyrus, and you see papyrus stalk here, we get the word paper. You think he might have even been more inspired, more energized than those around him? So when Woodson left their headquarters uh, at 1538 9th Street in DC, he comes back and people playing cards and wasting time. You know, when he, if, if they had known more, if they had known about Patahotep, there would have been other people perhaps that, have, that, have, that would have stood up and not let that that early home of Woodson and their headquarters uh, fall into dilapidation. And then a National Park Service and others have to come in. That's absolutely disrespectful. That's why I tell anybody, how do you go to DC and you simply go to the Washington Monument or Lincoln, uh, uh, the, the Lincoln um, Memorial and you don't go to the home of the great Carter G. Woodson? There's something wrong about that. There would have been more people would have been gun ho would have been energized to continue his legacy in a practical way. What if Woodson would have known about the Tahotep? Because he always talks about writing and literature, and there's so many different aspects of the writing tradition. What if he had known about the author of the first book in the history of humanity, even though he's pointing to Egypt? He knows that there's something there. He's beginning to unlock this knowledge. He's beginning to open up. It's like a treasure trove, a safe that's being opened up and Woodson, he picked the lock folks. He picked the lock, he's going into safe to be able to open up a whole realm, a whole body of knowledge. He didn't live to see all of it, but he created an organizational structure. And this is why we can talk about it today and learn and benefit from it today. He didn't know about the instructions of Patahotep. He doesn't mention Patahotep, but he talks about uh, important black people in Egypt. So he's learning. And so this is why the work continues. There's 37 lessons, by the way, in the structures of Patahotep. This is the original document. And anytime you see red, it's a new, uh, it's a, uh, <clears throat> it's a, it's a new, it's just a new section of his writings. 37 lessons, a new lesson, 37 lessons. And so what this is a tribute to Woodson. It, Patahotep's talking to him. If you're a leader, see uh, that the plans you are you make or carried out, do great things which will be remembered long after you. And we continue to do that. Woodson, it's been three quarters of a century and we still honor him as a leader. He, in, in, in one of the articles, he's talking about architecture. Uh, he, he's, he's aware of the pyramids. He's aware of the contributions of uh, in Kemet that represents the fountainhead of civilization. It's the foundation, the basis that helped to, as he said, create the first world's enlightenment. And this is what he's actually referring to. So Woodson is pointing people in the right direction. This is why we have to understand his work that continues today as him creating what we now consider African Heritage Month. It is incorrect to just focus on the US, particularly individuals after slavery. He actually mentions in the Negro History Bulletin, Abu Simbel, it's mentioned, it's stated specifically I suppose he's talking about the temple of Ramses II. 
These are mighty images of the greatest builder in the history of Africa. In fact, he's the single greatest builder in the history of humanity. Take a look at this temple. You don't see anybody, do you? Well, now you do. Take a look. Look at the size. Look at the mighty builders. Ramses, and you know when people go, the, the guides are intimidated when brothers are building on that scale. So you know what the guides say? The guides, they say that Ramses was ego tripping. I don't let the guys with, around me talk like that. No, nope, he wasn't ego tripping. He just intimidated when a brother has that level of confidence. They try to say he's a, meg, uh, he's a megalomaniac. Uh, megalomaniac. No, nope, he's a brother that's building for eternity. So back down and back off. They're intimidated by brothers who have that level of, uh, of, of confidence and strength. What's important about this is the science. So we don't really have time to go into it, but inside of the, the temple here is, uh, well, you got mighty statues. And so Woodson never went to see it, but he definitely references Abu Simbel. And, but inside of this temple, you got 180 feet, 60 meters where the sun shines in and uh, twice a year, February 22nd and October 22nd, the sun creeps in in this, uh, this special temple all the way into the Holy of Holies, just twice a year to light up statues in the inner shrine, the inner sanctuary. It's science at a whole nother level. It really is. And this is one of the great phenomena that people go to Abu Simbel and see the sun shining in the back of the Holy of Holies only twice a year to light up these statues. So I wonder why Woodson mentioned Abu Simbel. He doesn't go into details, but he knows. He talks about Black Death. I wonder if he would have, what would have been his reaction if he actually saw images of Hesse Ray, the first known dentist in the history of humanity. By the way, we have to agree on one thing. Hesse Ray just came from the barber. This is a fresh cut. Look at the beautiful helical structure of the hair. <laughs> Hesse Ray, he's the best, you know? And uh, of course we know about Tut Ankhamen, but this is obviously who Woodson has to be talking about because, you know, uh, the tomb was found in the 1920s. So he certainly was aware of the images of, of the mighty king himself. And he is as Afrikoid as they come. No question, this is, you know, and these are the parents of King Tutu. They're not the grandparents, parents. T and Amenhotep III. Uh, they were clearly African, it's an Afrikoid family. And so Woodson, he's learning and he's presenting some of this. He mentions Nefertari, take a look. This is how she's presented. Um, so we don't really have time to show all of the images, but Woodson was on to something when he's talking about and writing about African people and African contributions. And so his scholarship is in the right direction. He's beginning to clarify in his own understanding what these people were, who, who they were, and what contributions they were making as uh, Kemet became a nation. So even the dolls that they played with Africa, look at the material for the face, look at the beads representing black braided hair. Everything was Africoid, to say the least. He also mentions, he mentions the area, he says Luxor, that's the that's the uh, the Greek term, but it's the Waset area, which includes the Karnak Temple, and so um, and he mentions as well. He mentions an obelisk, so he he may be speaking about Karnak Temple directly or Luxor, but either way, take a look at the sacred lake inside of the Holy Temple of Karnak. This is in the grand. This is in the huge Waset or Wose area, and if you look very closely on the right, you see not an obelisk, that's the foreign term. This term is Tekken. You see two Tekken, and when in Kemet, when it's plural, it's Tekkenu. You add a U to make it plural. So you see the Tekkenu, and Woodson references them in this region. And it's important to see them, these, these, these images. And this is uh, Thutmose is the first, this is his daughter. Um, this is uh, Hatshepsut, you see, monuments made out of granite. And this is, by the way, about 97 feet, 320 uh, tons of, of, uh, of granite, one single block. And what's in, um, take, take a look at this. You got the Tekken and then you have the Washington Monument. Look at the reflecting pool and you got a replica there. This is not an original at all. It is built thousands and thousands of years later because George Washington admired African greatness. So there's nothing original about this. You got the original from Karnak and then you got the Washington Monument. 
And Woodson referenced, he referenced the Tekken or so-called obelisk. And so clearly this is the model for this uh, famous monument that was built thousands of years later in DC. Also, guess what? Woodson mentions the greatest statue on earth, Peru M. Akit, or the so-called Great Sphinx. He references, he mentions it. He doesn't go into a lot of details, but it's there in writing, in this publication, and he's referencing the greatest statue ever built in the history of humanity. You got uh, one single block of limestone, 66 feet high, 240 foot long monument. If you look at the bottom right here, this is a man in the box. You say, I don't really see him. Yes, that's the point I'm making. He's insignificant. But in respect to Woodson, he's mentioning this great statue that confounds people when they go see it. And this is clearly, even though the nose is missing, guess what? You got a profile view of an African even without the nose. So Woodson is correct to mention the greatest statue on earth as he's talking about art from Africa. And this is important. He's, he's focusing on African art before he starts to talk about the art in, uh, in the US. And here's what Woodson, I, I'm just about finished, but here's Woodson's pers uh, perspective on what the mission is. He says this in the, um, and 39, this is what Woodson said to get put things in perspective for folks. They had been, been um, publicly celebrating African Heritage Month. Uh, then it was just a week, but it was expanding. Again, Woodson saw a year as more relevant, but not eventually as a continued separate celebration, but that would be integrated into US and world history and contributions. But this is what he says, the aim of this generation should be to collect the records of the Negro and treat them scientifically in order that the race may not become a, a negligible factor in the thought of the world. So for him, it's not just about being a problem, being uh, a, a, a negative reference all the time. This is why it is dangerous for folks to always focus on who got defeated, who got beat up and locked up and there's never much focus on the positive. Where's the balance? Absolutely, we must be activists. Absolutely, we must protect and defend ourselves. But at the same time, when is the focus on the achievements? And this is why Woodson challenged people to go beyond listening to crazy speech and crazy talk by people that were making a whole lot of money. And when he actually passed away in uh, 50, one of his closest friends, Mary McLeod Bethune, who also worked in the association, she said this, I show, this was right after he passed in 50. He said, she said, I should, and by the way, you know who Bethune is. She's founder of now the uh, Bethune-Cookman College, historically black college, Florida. She says this, I shall always believe in Carter Woodson. He helped me to maintain faith in myself. He gave me renewed confidence in the capacity of my race for development with the power of a cumulative fact. He moved back the barriers and broadened our vision of the world and the world's vision of us. And this is what she said in her article, true leadership is timeless. And we must say generations later, the work of Woodson it continues with his organization and it is timeless. And the best that we can do is to know Woodson, understand Woodson and to continue his work and not, not allow anybody to sidetrack our effort to embrace one of the great thinkers and activists of our time who work diligently to make sure that people do not hijack, uh, 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 that they don't hijack the work. And so we, uh, I just wanna say this last thing, his journal, the Journal of African-American History. I don't know if you're aware but uh, since around 2016, they've made a shift. So he's always had associated publishers to be an independent uh, publisher, but there's some folks decided that, that uh, instead of being in-house printing, that they would go outside and start and, and, and choose a publisher. So now the Journal of African-American History is published by the University of Chicago. And this is contrary this white institute, this is contrary to what Woodson was about. For Woodson, it was about self-publishing. 
for Woodson was about publishing the truth in self-defense and nobody on the outside can do that for you. So there's actually a battle right now in the association to continue the legacy of Woodson as an independent thinker and historian and not let the work get hijacked by those who may have a different agenda. So uh, that's what's currently happening with the journal. In fact, it didn't even publish in 2018. How about that? After a century, it didn't publish. So now it's published, but you never know what to think. If you want to know more about that, there's a website that says getrightwithwoodson.com and you'll see get right with Woodson, you'll see what's currently happening. So anyway, that's the time I have. We'll say I just want to give you a little insight about Woodson beyond what people generally know, because our work continues. And as we continue our work, I'm sure Woodson will be quite proud that we continue in his legacy uh, as we uh, recover from historical amnesia. So I say. Thankful for the message today to wake us up. Uh, what a wonderful uh, a tribute to Dr. Carter G. Woodson and showing the ex expanse uh, that he did throughout his life. Uh, I'm going to extend the invitation now uh, to those of you that would like to become a part of us, would like to join us officially. Uh, we welcome you today uh, in the spirit of Carter, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, in the continual work of Professor Mainu Ampim, and all of those that are associated with the Wose community. We invite you to come. So won't you come today? We extend the invitation. Can't you hear this? Can't you hear the music playing? Uh, we, we extend the invitation to you. We're closing the doors. We're not letting you out until you uh, make a commitment. Uh, to join. What a beautiful uh, tribute to, to us today. Uh, you know, he gave us practical distribution of knowledge. He didn't like the district. He didn't like for ignorant statements to be made about African people. He, he actually fought with the authors of his day. What a great uh, informational uh, uh, a message that, that Professor Ampim gave us today. We can, we can go back and we can listen to some, and, and, and look at uh, some of the slides that he pointed out. And he showed us that even back in the, in, in the, in the olden days that Dr. Carter G. Woodson knew about Kemet, he knew about Abu Simbel, he knew about uh, the statue that uh, has been misnomered as the Sphinx. He knew about all of these things. He knew about the origin of Egypt. And had he gone on, had he been allowed to live longer, he might have even come to the correctness of that name, uh, which is not Egypt. Thank you, uh, Professor Ampim, for that message. Uh, I see things in the chat. Maybe some people have, have joined, and I can't see. I see a lot of people are uh, giving praise uh, to that message today. Uh, yes, uh, Brother Bill said, establish truth and expel falsehood. That is what is written in the Husea. Give thanks today. Uh, Professor Ampim, what a beautiful message. I'm going to turn it over to Mama Darnisha and uh, we're going to close out. I am Minister M. Hotep. Yes, sir. Each generation must get stronger. Each generation must get stronger. Must get that, stronger. That's true. And um, I don't know, uh, he's running neck and neck with you. I don't know if he's stronger than you, but uh, you know, he, he might know a little bit more academically, but I don't know if he's as strong as you yet, but uh, he's still- but He's he, there. He's, he's there. there. Yeah, but he, he's there. Well, uh, this sounds like a- You just haven't seen this side yet. This sounds like a proud father, <laughs> and we're proud of him too, and we're glad that you so, were instrumental in shaping such a great man. We Hello, are BJ. proud of you, Professor um, Pam. We are proud of you. That's right. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm proud of Wolsey. Good. Yeah. Hey, Mama yeah. Coffee. Hello, oh, Mama. Hey, How are you? Wonderful. Yes, yeah, so am I, sweetheart. So am I. I'm going to ask Sister Gloria now. I'm going to ask Sister Gloria now to close us out, and then we can get back to chit chat after the service is over. Give thanks. I know he 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 gives such a great message. We want to we want to praise him, but. Me, but uh, Sister Gloria, will you close us out with Lift Every Voice and Sing, and then Baba Sidney will give us the, the, the actual closing. 
I just want to say uh, how grateful and so honored I am to be here today and to listen to all of the wonderful messages and the historical tribute. I mean, my head is this big. My heart is this big. Started with the um, started with the uh, meditation, letting the light shine, letting our light shine. So here we go. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmony of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening sky. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of our new day begun let us march on till victory is won and you are the most beautiful people on the face of this earth. <laughs> I say, I say, I say. And as, and as we uh, close out in a beautiful uh, rendition, as we close out and we, we join hands uh, virtually together, as we hold one another uh, closely, as uh, Professor uh, uh, Amenu had, had laid out before us, as he laid out those steps of those great ones, those ancestors, in whose uh, 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 path we are walking. As he said, we need to uh, get our information, study ourselves and treat it scientifically. I say that not only take it to that next level that we read up and we study those whose paths that we are following. And we, he uh, quoted Mary McLeod Bethune as saying that leadership, these, these paths that we're walking, that leadership it's timeless that we continue to walk on this particular journey. I say that we See. stand together and we be together and we follow on the path of all those greats, all those ancestors who have passed and have marked the, to the, the, the path for us to walk and have passed on and that we pick up that torch and we continue to march. And so as we hold hands and close out this uh, portion of the service, as we hold up those great ancestors from from the past that we hold one another close and we call them the name of the most high and the words that have been saying since time immemorial that we say. Ah, you are the most beautiful people on the face of this and yet another successful Wose Sunday. Everything just falls in place when you have the right people, the right spirit, the right mind, all combined on the right thing. You get days like today. Right. So I want to thank everybody for being here. I did not receive any special announcements. There's no activities that I know of that are specially coming up. Uh, this week. Um, I know that we'll be having a Black Knowledge Matters uh, Wednesday. Can I announce that, uh, Mama Darnisha? And I know Minister Imhotep is going to tell us exactly what that's going to be. So this is going to be um, a really exciting, controversial, maybe a little scary, uh, because uh, we're going to be discussing uh, the book, A Thin Line Between Love and Hate a black man's journey through life and the CIA. 
So we're, t we're gonna be talking with a brother that was actually working in the CIA and he's written a book. He's the cousin of brother Damani. And so uh, we're excited that he's going to come and uh, you know, there's only so much you can say. Uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, he had to be approved to read this, to, to actually write this book. Uh, but uh, his name is uh, brother Daryl. Um, let's see, wait a minute. His, 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 his name is uh, Daryl uh, Lancey, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to him uh, this Wednesday. So that's at five o'clock uh, Pacific Standard Time uh, uh, for Black Knowledge Matters. And if I can just jump in, um, we are starting uh, the uh, minister in training uh, uh, classes begin on uh, this coming Tuesday, which I believe is the 9th. Um, we were, um, the, the class was canceled, well, rescheduled last week because something had come up. Um, <clears throat> and so we're starting this week and I'm really, uh, 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 we're opening up the doors to all those who are interested. You don't necessarily have to be a minister or want to be a minister, you just start, getting that knowledge. And as uh, uh, Minister, uh, I mean, uh, Professor Maynou had, had pointed out that uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Carter G. Woodson has said that we need to start looking at our history, start looking at, uh, at, these, at, at who we are scientifically. So we actually sit down and discuss and let's talk and let's gather as much information as we can. Uh, my thoughts have always been that knowledge is never wasted you may not be able to use it at that moment. I see. Sometimes you learn something I or you hear something yes, that yes. might spark something later on. I see. So we're just opening it up to all of those who may be interested to, to come in and, and, and listen to it and gather that knowledge. Let's study our, our, our path. Let's study our spiritual history with a little scientific, a little put a little work into it. And who knows where it might go? So you don't have to be a minister in training. Just come on and get that information, and who knows where the Most High will take you. I see. I see. I see. What time on Tuesday, Baba Sydney? Ah, it starts at six o'clock. It begins at six o'clock, and um, it's two hours, six to eight. Come on in, get as much as, and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, a, a lot of you there. Let's uh, let's share some of this knowledge. I see. All right. And uh, does anyone have anything that they would like to share uh, with the community? Any other announcements, important things going on, things we would like to share? Well, with that, Baba Sydney, I think you get to close this thing out. <laughs> okay. Well, again, I just want to, you know, Every week, as, as I say, every portion of our service to me is my favorite part. I say I, I love the opening song. I love the 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 the, the libation. I, I I love the circle prayer. I love the the candle of, of justice. I love the historical uh, tribute. I love the 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 song, the the particular songs that were picked out. And then I just love the fact, especially like say when. Uh, 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 Professor Maynou speaks, he, he just has this, his own unique style, you know, he has his own unique style and all of the, all of those presenters who come on have been powerful. So uh, again, they're all my favorite. I'll say that today that Professor Maynou is my favorite. Then next week, it might be Minister Imhotep is my favorite. And the following week, it's all favorite. And so we, we look forward to your continued involvement. We look forward to you uh, coming in. And if you can't make it to the minister in training, maybe make it to the uh, uh, Black Knowledge Matters, make it in, just, just get in where you fit in. Let's continue to push this forward. Let's continue to uh, learn about one another. Let's continue to love one another. Let's continue to spread the word and follow in the footsteps of those ancestors that have passed uh, uh, before us. And with that, I'm looking forward to seeing some of you on Tuesday night. Looking forward to uh, hearing about, my wife may come on to Black Knowledge Matters. I'm usually tied up at that time. I'm looking forward to hearing how that went. 
And from here on, like I say, I will, my heart will be with you. Pray for me and I will pray for you. Looking forward to next week. I love each and every one of you. I I see you. Well, I would like to remind everyone that you could, uh, uh, you know, so much was said and so much was done. A beautiful tribute. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Bob and Daly, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, the late uh, Julian Richardson, his African name was Mockendow. Uh, he, he, yes. Um, when, when I went to his uh, home going, I think it was in 2000 at the Herbst Theater, that was one of the things that was said. Was was that was his African name, Mockendal. Uh So um, you know, just a little beautiful uh, information. Uh, Mariana gave gave told us to be how, how to be safe. Uh, and then, of course, Mainu uh, his his works uh, speak for themselves. And uh, oh man, just just so many things that that have gone on uh, in this service today. Uh, glad to see everyone. Sister BJ, you're looking excellent uh, there. That was her word for us uh, many times. She would sometimes she wouldn't say excellent, but when she did, we really uh, we knew we really knew she meant it. It is excellent, Minister Motep. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> yes, indeed. If I could interrupt for just a second, um, someone I believe is missing an item that you purchased in December. I don't know who that person is, but if you are missing it and you communicated it with me, if you could communicate again, I got a message. It like popped up on my phone or watch or something and I can't find a record of the message, but I know that it seems that there's somebody with a problem. If you are, I'm not ignoring you. I just had bad organization and lost it. So remind me, please. Thank you. And Minister Malley, thank you for the prayer. Um, also, I saw in the chat, Sister Isali was asking for prayer. Uh, this this uh, happened after, uh, I believe she wrote in here. I'm, I'm looking, I'm scrolling. Um, but we're all standing in the need of prayer. It's 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 uh, it's for sure. And uh, thank you. Minister Malley for uh, giving us, uh, you know, that that spiritual jump off uh, at, at the beginning of service. Um, I was glad to see Babu Ustadi, Brother Kalahari. Malik, you must get the award for the greatest backgrounds of during the service. Hakanke uh, <laughs> is shaking her head. Yes, indeed. Brother Hanif and Sister Lola, good to see you. Where, where are you? Are, are you in the, the Bay Area or, or where, where are you located there? Brother Hanif, take yourself off mute. Just curious. Yeah, I'm not hearing you. I'm sure you'll come through when you take yourself off mute. Okay. Baba, while yeah. we're waiting for him, it's good to see Sister Shanita is here. And don't forget to pray for her mother, who was recently um, put on hospice. Good to see you, Shanita. Yes, 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 indeed. Yes. And the question that Mama Connie wants to just bring up, we didn't actually end up having a WOW meeting on the 3rd. Am I right or wrong? You're right. We did not. Okay. So and, and I think though we should send we should do it like next week. We have Tuesday going on. We have Black Knowledge, so I think we should do it next week. Okay, so so if everybody's not, in not agreement the, with yes, that. But the seventeenth. Okay. So we'll, okay, yeah, we'll take our next yeah. meeting on the seventeenth. Okay. okay. Sir? Sounds good. Okay. I say. Okay. Just say, um, so I had to leave out for a few minutes, but the um, Miss Hilda Kearney, who I spoke about at the beginning, had her surgery during the course of our service and everything came out fine. So thank you. Thank oh, you, Professor oh. Manu, because maybe your vibration served to help that. But the whole <laughs> will say thank you very much, Madassi. Blessing, sister. I say. Great. great. That's, 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 uh, that's some great news. Thank you for sharing that. All right, Aziza, you got your camera working. Uh, so, did you get a new, did you get a new computer, or, or did, was it a setting that you needed to change? What happened? We're glad to see your beautiful face. 
Well, now you got to take stuff we off could, mute. Uh, we could we could no, usually see it. We couldn't hear all the time. Uh, Mama Aziza can, can hear you. Can Can I just ask real quick? I don't know whether or not. Can I just, I want to ask real quick, Sister BJ, I sent you a package. Did you get it? This is Baba Tai. I did. Thank you very okay. much. Peace. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead, Rana. Oh, it's, it's nothing. She just, um, I spoke with her yesterday or day before. She asked me to make sure that I said hello to everyone from her and to tell you that She's with you and sending you love and hugs. She is working on her computer because as you know, at one time we could see her. I don't know that we could ever hear her, but we definitely could see her. And I believe there's someone in her household with her that's more um, computer friendly than she is who's helping to get it back on track. But I'm still keeping uh, uh, Mama Thandiway's offer in mind in the event she's not able to get it back to 100%. Um, we'd be happy and I'd be happy to facilitate uh, trying to get a computer to her from you, that would be great. So I'm supposed to touch base with her either later today or tomorrow to see exactly what she was able to restore with regard to her computer. That's all. Well, that's that's outstanding. Um, Menu, are you uh, going to be doing your usual session at two o'clock today? Yes, it's gonna be a repeat from last week. It was, uh, it was another version of uh, Woodson. Yeah, because I, I got to work on a project. So it's going to be another version of Woodson uh, from last week. The message to Wose is always different than the general public. Uh, I got to prepare differently for, for Wose. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, it was more work because I want to make sure it's some new stuff that she has some gems and some juicy stuff that you can use and make practical. So yeah, my Africana Studies program, it will be, if you missed it last week, it's on the Woodson. It's a little bit more on the celebration because the public doesn't know quite as much as the Wolsey community. And I also wanted to share just a brief update on our Wolsey Historical Archives project. We, we're making a lot of progress. You all will be very pleased with uh, the range of materials that we've got in as we're organizing the space at Wolsey Oakland. And we'll be able to uh, soon start to digitize all of the materials and scan them. So uh, it's things that uh, people have forgotten or you don't really know about. But one thing that's really interesting, if you look at the archival material and if somebody did not look, did not know much about we'll say, they know that it's a, it's a organizational focus on uh, African culture and tradition. And it's a strong intellectual tradition because there's different versions, for example, of Zamani. Then there's the Wall State newsletters. Then there's the Ile Omade publications. <laughs> and so uh, and it's like it's different versions of each one. So uh, when you look at the, the chronology of all this, it's, it's pretty interesting. And when you look at it, so, uh, so we're uh, much closer to uh, putting that together. And once we finish, we have a good core group that's dedicated to help. And once we finish this phase of creating the archive since 1980, then the next phase is the oral history project. So really all the old, old timers. So we'll give you a heads up so you can get the brain turning and, and by the way, and start thinking about some critical things. Also, you know, most people when they take photographs they don't label the photographs. So then you have to try to go back later and identify when it was taken, where it was taken, who was there. So at some point we will we'll have to have a, uh, a session where we just say, okay, now who can tell us about this photograph? Because <laughs> we got many of them and they're not identified. I think a lot, of, a lot of times we can ballpark it, but so that's where we are anyway. We're really close to it and it will give energy and inspiration to the ongoing work when you see what has been done over the last four decades and what continues to be done in the tradition of Woodson. You all are, are busy bees uh, there. Uh, you guys are really working there. Um, Bill, I want to thank you for all your help today. And, um, you know, Bill is, is, is continually pulling up out things. You know, if you, if you pay attention to the chat, if a, if a scripture is mentioned, he's got it in there. Or if it's a subject <laughs> mentioned, he's got the URL. 
So he's 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 busily uh, going. Um, also, I want to. Um, I hope that I'm not uh, talking out of school, but uh, you know, since we're all in the need of prayer, uh, Baba Jeff's um, mother is having some health challenges, and um, so we'd like to keep her. Uh, uh, Bobby, her name is uh, Henrietta Moore, uh, so, to keep her in our prayers as well. Thank you, Brother Minister. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're there. Okay, I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Well, look, it's one eighteen. Let's let's get off the phone. I talk to you, I talk to you on Tuesday. All right. Come to class on Tuesday, Minister and Tranny Rana. Those di dishes look delicious that you're posting on Facebook. Um, you know, I, I take pictures of, of, of things that I make or Doris makes, uh, but, um, you know, yours, you obviously are a cul culinary person. Uh, maybe you went to school for that. I don't know. But, uh, you, you know, they look delicious. So if you're not Facebook friends with Sister Rana, she has some really good dishes that she's been posting lately on Facebook. All right. Um, Thank you. I appreciate it. I did not go to school and I am so Pleased to know that I could appease you at least visually because I have heard about your very picky, picky, picky taste buds. So yeah, uh, if you can, yeah. you can handle somebody picky. The rest of the crowd is usually all right. So yeah, I, I, yeah. I appreciate the compliment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, one love, one heart, one God, one aim, one destiny. Today was my mom's birthday. If she had lived, she'd been ninety-one today. And yesterday was, of course, the Honorable Marcus, uh, the Honorable Robert Nesta Marley, Bob Marley, Baherney Selassie's birthday. All right, wake up and live, catch a fire, who the cap fits, one love, one God, one aim, one destiny, live up. <laughs>